Dr. Sibyl, it's such an honor for me to be here speaking with you on India's neighborhood and the developments around India. Um, it really is a privilege to have this time with you. Um, you've been Foreign Secretary to the Government of India. You've also been National Security Advisory Board member. Um, so let me ask you a wider question to begin with. Uh, the world has gone through troubled times in the last three years. You know, we've uh, seen the pandemic, we've seen the Russia-Ukraine war, we've seen uh, tensions in the South China Sea, and we've also seen uh, the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. How do you think, really, has India negotiated this uh, development on a macro level? Because the world really seems to be in a flux. Well, you know, the world has always been in flux. This is not the first time that we are facing the kind of problems you mentioned. Look at our own relations with the United States until we signed the nuclear deal. It is the country that punished us most strategically in terms of sanctions, making sure that we d didn't develop our strategic capabilities. Uh, the Soviet Union collapsed as a, as a result of which uh, we had huge issues with regard to maintaining uh, military preparedness. And Russia was our biggest economic partner. And that trade uh, collapsed. The Taliban has been in power <laughs> in Afghanistan before. So it's not as if this, this hasn't happened before. In fact, uh, it is after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan that uh, the United States, Saudi Arabia, and others built up the jihadi forces to fight the communists in Afghanistan and have left a very bitter legacy uh, in terms of terrorism and extremism and everything else in our neighborhood. Uh, so it's, it's not as if uh, India is facing entirely new challenges which we haven't faced before. In fact, in some ways, the challenges we faced earlier were more difficult and we were weaker uh, economically, uh, even in a sense politically, because we had coalition governments in between uh, which couldn't formulate any uh, steady policies. Uh, and we were under pressure uh, by the United States in particular. And Europe joined in, Japan joined in. But we succeeded. Today we are much stronger. Fifth largest economy now with a leadership that is respected all over the world because there is a feeling that India is achieving uh, its goals and is rapidly going to become a power to reckon with in the international distribution of influence and power. That's why there's an effort to uh, court us. We have perhaps uh, the third largest uh, military force in the world, so it's not as if uh, we are unable to defend ourselves. In fact, if you look at what is happening on our front today, on the Ladakh front today, uh, and earlier in Doklam, we have stood up, stood up to China. We have their self-confidence that 1962 is over. In fact, that is another uh, difficult period that we have uh, gone through. So I'm very confident that we can uh, manage and navigate uh, these difficulties. It will, it will always be a challenge because we have to balance things. There is no way that we can join this side or that side because that will mean we'll become prisoners of either side and lose our capacity to maneuver. It's, it is easier, it is not as easy as it sounds because there are pressures and we are linked to the uh, global economy and we have serious challenges on our border, territorial cha challenges from China as well as uh, Pakistan. So we have to make sure that uh, uh, we have enough, uh, how should I say, equities with all the parties that uh, they will value India's territorial integrity and its future growth in, the interest, in their own interest, in their own interest. We are, with, if our population has uh, <coughs> now, uh, more, is now more than China's, we are now the largest market in the world. Yeah. And look at the unfulfilled consumption uh, in this country. Young population uh, with a low per capita income, 
So in a sense, uh, the huge, huge potential for the rest of the world uh, to look at India with very different eyes and uh, make sure that uh, the largest country in the world by way of population, and one of the largest countries, otherwise a democratic uh, country, uh, is able to play its uh, role in terms of shaping uh, the future of the world to the advantage of everyone. Quite right. Um, before I come to our immediate neighborhood, let me ask you, how does foreign policy work in terms of, you know, now what we are seeing on a global stage? India has different interests in the Eurasian heartland and different interests and policies in the Indo-Pacific. Is this the way foreign policy works? This is true of every country. It's not that we are alone in this. Look at the United States of America, uh, the strongest power in the world. Uh, but uh, uh, it, it doesn't have to make choices. It is there everywhere. It thinks that it, its security uh, begins uh, in every corner of the world. That's why they have the largest military force in the world to protect uh, their interests. And uh, they follow contradictory policies. Uh, they have been extremely supportive of Israel, uh, but also very supportive uh, of uh, the Arab world. Uh, Turkey is a NATO member, and Turkey is flirting uh, with the other bloc, but the United States is uh, tolerating this. In the South China Sea and elsewhere, they have these, all these alliances. Uh, Japan is at loggerheads with South Korea, and yet the United States has alliance with both countries. It's present in the region and tries to navigate uh, this dif with dif as, 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 as much as possible. Uh, they are very much present uh, uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, they have revived their ties with Philippines. At a time when under Duterte, uh, Philippines was ceding a lot of ground to China, but the United States was managing this. What I mean is that uh, even you take Russia, it's a different matter that today uh, Russia and the United States are at, at loggerheads and the relationship has collapsed. But uh, Russia, while supporting and promoting multipolarity, and that was the origin of the Russia-India-China dialogue, was reaching out to the United States. They were. Uh, but it's a different matter that the United States uh, had a different vision on how to deal with Russia in the future and take advantage of the Soviet collapse to permanently uh, weaken Russia. But Russia was very, especially at the time, just before I went as their ambassador, uh, Russia was moving away from us and moving towards Europe. They, they still think they are Europeans. I mean, this, these are uh, just illustrations of uh, how uh, countries uh, in, to protect their interests uh, have to pursue policies which cannot be mathematically uh, so well balanced that you can uh, say that uh, they don't make compromises here and there. So they make compromises, they deal with contradictions in the pursuit of their national interests, and India has, has to do that. Uh, you mentioned uh, Russia and China. Even right now we see them coming closer you know, through this uh, Ukraine-Russia war. Do you think that is going to have an impact on India? Well, in some senses, yes, uh, because when uh, the Russians uh, launched the Russia-India-China dialogue. That was at a time when U.S. unilateralism was uh, at its height. And they were changing the map of the world wherever they could, especially in the Middle East with the regime changes. And then destabilizing the periphery of uh, Russia by these color revolutions. That's how the problem in Ukraine initially began, also Georgia. Uh, so, um, uh, now, Russia and China have become very close together because the United States has openly, formally declared both as their adversaries. One the short-term adversary, the other the long-term adversary. They have cut off all relations with Russia virtually, virtually. Uh, they want to isolate Russia, weaken Russia. They don't want to buy Russian energy. So what does Russia do? China is hungry for resources right next door. They are contiguous. 
they can buy whatever Russia was offering to the rest of the world, Europe and, and United States, especially Europe, where there is oil, energy, the raw materials. They, they can uh, supply China, uh, which would want more and more in order to have as much uh, autonomy as possible uh, in, in these areas and not be dependent or be vulnerable to the uh, interruption, uh, disruption of their lines of communication with regard to oil, especially through the Indian Ocean and state of Malacca and everything else. China can supply consumer goods uh, to, to Russia. It can supply certain uh, technologies that Russia would now need, including semiconductors. Uh, now, the balance in the RIC has changed. Earlier on, Russia was top dog. Uh, China was in the middle. India was the weaker, weakest link. Now, now Russia, China have become very strong partners. So in that triangle, India has become even weaker than before. Uh, it is very important, therefore, that uh, we maintain our ties uh, with Russia to make sure of two things. That Russia continues to value its relations with India. Uh, and, and number two, uh, it presents some kind of a disincentive to China uh, to uh, to rock uh, the SEO, BRICS, and everything else, because then that can't work. And Russia has this goal of multipolarity, this and that, which we share. But that will not advance if India-China relationship are not better uh, uh, controlled. And finally, uh, although the Russians won't admit this publicly, now they need India to balance China. Uh, because they, are be they know they are becoming far too dependent. So in order to reduce their dependency, just as we are doing, we are in the uh, board and we are in the Indo-Pacific and we have very strong relations with the United States, but we don't want to become prisoners of this. And therefore we want to maintain our ties with Russia as also keep our dialogue with China open. Because this gives us flexibility and maneuverability in our diplomacy. So Russia would also want to do the same thing in this Russia, India, China triangle. So yes, it is a problem, but it's a manageable problem. So you said that uh, you know uh, it would be in our benefit for relations to improve with China, but we've seen China take quite an aggressive position on our borders, and we've seen India also not really back down or bow down to this pressure. Um, do you think that this trust deficit that we have with China can be overcome what do you think is the future for India-China relationship? And what is the roadmap for it? I, I don't think there was ever any trust between India and China. Right. That uh, trust uh, evaporated completely in 1962. But in the lead up to that, uh, there was really no trust. It was trying to manage the new situation we were faced with, with China occupying Tibet and for the first time in history uh, becoming our immediate neighbor. And if you remember Sardar Patel's uh, note to Nehru at that time, it was very clear, even at that time, what he foresaw that China will be a big, big problem for us. It was a question of managing a big power. And that problem uh, continues. The trust is not there. Uh, you know, on the issue of trust, international relations are never really built on trust beyond a certain point. Trust only comes into the extent that, look, if we have had an agreement, you will honor it. And, uh, and then, of course, the policy should be to create disincentives to the other side so as not to break the agreement. Uh, with China, uh, this has not worked as we would have wanted. We entered into all these agreements in order to uh, manage the border and avoid the potential of an actual military clash. And this was working. This was not based on trust. <laughs> it was based on what we thought the Chinese would also see it in their own interest uh, to keep the borders stable. And since their major problem is in the Western Pacific, where they're facing United States power, United, they're not facing US power on our, uh, in our region. They're facing it there. So they have no interest in having a two-front situation. Uh, so we were 
calculating on that. But with Xi Jinping and his vision of China's role and sovereignty and everything else, he has injected uh, a very destabilizing element in our ties. Uh, with uh, in, in a ties with China because there was no need for him uh, to station 50, 60,000 forces. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, what, what can he do? A few kilometers of territory, of course, it's a big blow to Indian prestige and public opinion will never accept that. But at the end of the day, uh, they'll capture some territory, a few kilometers here and there. At what cost? It's irrational. But China thinks that it must uh, be the lord of Asia and potentially uh, the lord of the world, the heavenly kingdom, and what have you. And uh, India, they seek quite rationally, is the only country in Asia, the only country that can challenge China. Uh, so they want to retard India's growth as much as possible, keep an India under pressure, use that period of India's relative weakness to increase their presence around us, penetrate our neighborhood, make it more difficult for us to exercise our power, keep building Pakistan as a strategic counterweight to us. It's a challenge, but then we'll face it. I will come back to what you just said about penetrating our neighborhood. But before that, I want to shift our attention to another troubled area, which is the northwestern frontier. We've seen the Taliban take over. We've also seen uh, P uh, you know, organizations like PTM or TTP. Uh, and their role in Pakistan. How do you think, uh, or, you know, let me rephrase this. Uh, do you think Pakistan was premature in its celebrations of the Taliban takeover? And how do you think it's going to impact Pakistan in the long run? It's not that they've made this mistake the first time. Uh, they've committed a series of mistakes. And the biggest mistake they've made is to not, not get over their paranoia about India. Other countries in the course of the last uh, 50, 60, 70 years uh, have uh, tried to overcome uh, the misunderstandings, the conflicts of the past, wherever they could. Even US and Russia tried that. It's a different matter that uh, because of NATO expansion and cornering Russia, that, that effort to have a stable security arch architecture in Europe collapsed. Uh, but Pakistan has never given up on its basics. Kashmir, Hindu India, uh, no trade with us, uh, jihad, terrorism, it's continued. There's no change in the thinking of their policy makers. Uh, and then they have always uh, felt that since geographically they're a narrow country and within the reach of our air force and this and that, even in terms of artillery and Brahmos and all, they're all very vulnerable. They don't have depth at all. That two things they wanted, or three things. One is to get strategic depth by, put, by controlling Afghanistan. Secondly, uh, especially General Zia, who was radicalizing Pakistan. So they felt that an Islamic force in Afghanistan would be far congenial uh, to their strategic and national security interests than a secular kind of, kind of a government which would have more leanings towards India. But if it was an Islamic government and they shared that uh, religious, uh, uh, yeah, then uh, it gives them added strength uh, towards India. And third, of course, base of terrorism. Uh, in, in Afghanistan gives them deniability. Uh, and there's a history of Afghans from generally this region, uh, even in 1947, coming as raiders and everything else. Uh, so they were calculating on that. Uh, and of course, one important thing was they felt that if there was an Islamic government, there won't be a national government. And if that was the case, then the Durand line issue uh, would recede into the background. Now they miscalculated. Even in the earliest, earlier phase when Taliban was in power, they didn't accept the Durand line, and even now they don't. And now uh, the Taliban uh, is trying to gain independence from uh, Pakistani overlordship, and Pakistan's efforts to put Haqqani group there in order to control them uh, from within hasn't entirely uh, succeeded. Uh, and then, of course, the PTM. Uh, which uh, 
is the Lal Masjid fellows, uh, uh, the Taliban, uh, Pakistani Taliban. They're not at all happy with the present government. Uh, and therefore, they're using Afghanistan in the reverse as a base uh, to carry on their depredations in Pakistan. So Pakistan is in a very difficult position. Added to that, of course, their economic collapse. But then uh, Pakistan has to manage its own affairs. Quite right. But, uh, you know, with the PTM, TTP, and now there are some, uh, you know, there's been some reports about BLA joining Taliban as well. Uh, like you said, the economic uh, situation in Pakistan. Oh, sorry, I mentioned PTM, it's the TTP. TTP. Yeah, sorry. Mm. Uh, but, um, you know, with uh, the economic issues in Pakistan as well, A, do you think that the Durand line will sustain or, you know, there could be some sort of decimation of the line as we see it? And two, do you think um, Pakistan can, or in the near future, there might be a balkanization of Pakistan. If so, what sort of impact does it have on India? I don't think there will be a balkanization of uh, Pakistan. Uh, the only possibility would be if uh, the Pakistan military collapses. You know, Punjab dominates, absolutely dominates uh, Pakistan in terms of everything, including the armed forces. And uh, if the adage is true that uh, Pakistan is a military with the state, then uh, the military will keep the state uh, alive. That's one factor. The other is that China will not allow this to happen as much as they can to prevent this. Uh, they have huge uh, strategic st stakes, the CPEC, Gwadar, potential naval base in Pakistan, their entire maritime strategy keeping India under check that India is released uh, from a huge vice in which we are, we are caught because of Chinese policies and with Pakistan. They won't, uh, they, they will uh, prevent this as much as uh, possible in terms of showing up the military, giving a sustenance or whatever. And thirdly, uh, at the end of the day, you know, we also have in India uh, elements, uh, forces, uh, uh, which might give the impression that uh, there is a tussle between the center and the states uh, in, in some parts of India. Of course, in our case, it is more a reflection of our democratic life. Uh, in the Pakistan's case, it has a different dimension. It is the absolute over-domination of Punjab, uh, which breeds resentments in Sindh and uh, Pakhtunwa. Uh, so, uh, therefore, I think that even if there are these internal fissures uh, in, in Pakistan, uh, I think both uh, the logic of creation of uh, Pakistan uh, and uh, the power of the armed forces plus external support that they have uh, will sustain them, will sustain them. Uh, but like you said earlier that uh, Pakistan um you know, seems to concentrate on India, and that has been their, you know, internal policy for decades. Uh, General Bajwa even recently, as news has uh, said, that uh, the Pakistani army doesn't stand a chance against the Indian army. Yet, they seem to use terror as a state policy towards India. Recently, we saw the uh, attack in Poon sector as well. How do you think India should be reacting to this? And do you think that India has now completely moved on from Pakistan and is positioning itself as, you know, more of a global player than, you know, recognizing itself only in terms of the India-Pakistan issue? You see, what they're keeping, what they're doing is to keep this uh, uh, terrorist threat uh, at a very low threshold. On the one hand, the ceasefire, uh, is uh, continuing, and and there is no effort on their part to break the break, break the ceasefire. Uh, but uh, these little pinpricks here and there they continue. Uh, this is to uh, keep the situation in uh, Jammu and Kashmir, if not on the boil, but relatively unstable, uh, because these punctual. Uh, terrorist attacks uh, here and there can create an atmosphere that things are not under control, government of India's policy is not fully succeeding, 
uh, that the Kashmiris are still not uh, fully reconciled with the changes in Jammu and Kashmir. The political elements in, in Kashmir which uh, are resentful of the uh, government of India's uh, revision of Article 370 and statehood and everything else. Uh, it is also to tell them continue your struggle and this and that, stuff like that. But it's a relatively risk-free policy for them. Uh, because if uh, each time a small attack occurred and we did Pulwama, it doesn't, it, we did uh, Balakot, it doesn't make sense. Uh, so it's, it's not an easy situation uh, for us. And at the end of the day, uh, we have to, you know, step up our uh, own uh, uh, efforts on the ground uh, to control and eliminate uh, uh, these terrorists and uh, pursue this uh, path of development uh, in Jammu and Kashmir gives stakes uh, to the people in Jammu and, and Kashmir in a broadly democratic framework in the hope that then the situation will be begin to grow better. Uh, we have breathing space with, the pa with Pakistan in huge trouble mm -hmm. despite <laughs> what happened just now. We have breathing space and we should use it uh, to the extent we can. The one question I didn't answer about uh, the Durand line. Uh, the Afghans won't accept it. Uh, they have broken down some of the fencing that has been made. Uh, it's a very difficult situation for Pakistan uh, because the Taliban, uh, there are Afghans on both sides of the border. Now look at the Kartarpur corridor. Hmm? Uh, there, there is a Guruwara there and the people in uh, uh, this side of the Punjab, they can see it, they want to go there. Government of India is compelled to open this corridor to do that. I mean, this is a very small matter, but when you have huge populations and there are virtually no Sikhs on left in the other side of the Punjab, but you have, let's say, in a parallel situation, huge number of Afghans this side, huge number of Afghans on the other side, they now would accept the closure of the border or the Durand line as a formal border. As an informal border, yes, the other the parallel I'd like to mention to you is about uh, all this talk about uh, uh, no borders in Jammu and Kashmir, you know, this four-point plan, 14-point plan, God knows what it was. Uh, weren't we saying that borders formally won't be changed, but there'll be no border? So just transpose that uh, to the Pakistan-Afghan situation and you have the answer. Quite right. But, uh, you know, let me come back to China because the rest of the neighborhood seems to be rather impacted by China's infiltration or uh, stakeholding in their countries. Let's say Myanmar. Uh, we've seen a regime change in Myanmar. There's been a military takeover. We've also seen China's footprints in Myanmar. How does India negotiate its relationship with Myanmar? And does it make a difference to India? Because India being a democratic country and upholds democratic values, does it make a difference to India that maybe Myanmar isn't a democratic country? No, really speaking, I mean, when was Pakistan a democratic country? <laughs> and uh, when was Nepal until recently a democratic country in that sense? I mean, we have now such excellent relations with the Gulf monarchies, but they are not democratic countries. So I think we, sh I'm very clear of the view that uh, we should not use this language of democratic values and things like that. This is just an American uh, formulation. Uh, in order to justify their hegemony, uh, promotion of democracy and human rights. It gives them the opportunity to interfere in the internal affairs of countries. And given their own history, uh, uh, they, they try to seek higher moral ground. You know, uh, even now look at the way they treat their blacks and everything else. Anyway, that's, uh, I'm not anti-American, I'm just saying that, I'm just looking at things very realistically. Uh, but to the extent I'll modify my argument a little bit, to the extent that uh, our upholding of the language of democratic values and this and that helps in our relations with the United States, we should do it. We keep saying that we are the largest democracy in the world, we are the oldest democracy in the world. Uh, we share democratic values with the United States. Each time we are saying that we share the same values, we share the same values. It's a good diplomatic uh, way to uh, reach out to the United States uh, political class, but we shouldn't begin to believe this. Uh, for example, 
India was a democratic country right from 1947. Uh, China under Mao and subsequent uh, leaders has been an archetypal totalitarian communist state. We were punished by the United States until the nuclear agreement. And in that period and subsequent, China has been built up. They were dealing with a Maoist regime in China at the cost of Indian democracy. So therefore, we have to be a little... Now, with regard to Myanmar, uh, we can't control the internal affairs uh, in our neighboring countries. Of course, Han Sang Suu Kyi uh, had relations with India, family relations with India. She won the elections fairly and squarely, and purely from uh, the viewpoint of uh, a position to take theoretically, yes, it was absolutely wrong. But then, you've taken that position, suppose you take that position, it is wrong, then what follows? You don't protect your interests in Myanmar, you have to. Therefore, you have to reach out to the military government for two, three reasons. One, of course, that we have direct border with them. We have insurgencies uh, in that area which have, uh, which position themselves on the other side. Uh, we need the military help to control this uh, insurgency. Uh, our activist policy can never really succeed on the ground without Myanmar, so therefore we have to nurture that part of the relationship. We may have to make sure that they don't fall into the lap of China more and more and more and more. They've created this uh, Myanmar-China corridor. Uh, they have uh, built this port, it's a difficult uh, name to pronounce. Uh, and, uh, and now, of course, there are reports about they're doing some mischief on the Cocoa Islands. Uh, so we have to make sure that uh, we don't alienate the Myanmar regime uh, to the extent that uh, the Chinese, in fact, get an opportunity uh, to further increase the stranglehold over uh, Myanmar. Therefore, we have to deal with that regime. And the Americans, <clears throat> of course, today is a bit different. They're targeting uh, Russia, the, uh, 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 a nuclear power which is as strong as the United States. But otherwise, they've chosen weakened countries uh, far away you know, to impose their sanctions. So they have bullied uh, Myanmar uh, without taking into cognizance how it hurts our, uh, our strategic interests. But then, even in Bangladesh, uh, uh, on this democracy business and everything else, in the Summit for Democracy, they don't invite Bangladesh. Whereas we have very, very high stakes in Bangladesh, but the United States pursues policies in our region which are not always aligned with our interests. But uh, this is a reality we have to deal with. Absolutely. Uh, you know, with the sanctions, the Burma 2020 sanctions on Myanmar, and, you know, I think, uh, like you said, you know, it's uh, been done without any consideration on the impact on India. Uh, but having said that, you mentioned uh, Cocoa Islands as well. You know, similarly, like the militarization of Cocoa Islands by China, uh, there's been a certain amount of impact in other smaller, geographically smaller, but strategically important neighborhood countries like Sri Lanka or Nepal. How do you think India can develop its relationship to counter China in these uh, states? And maybe how can they sort of respond to their relationship to India as well? You know, we've always had uh, great difficulties with our neighbors. I was uh, for a long time Shadid Affairs in Nepal also. Um, Nepal is in fact uh, in some ways even more difficult uh, for us than our other neighbors because it has direct, uh, apart from Pakistan, Pakistan is a sui generis case, uh, but it is direct contiguity with uh, Tibet. Uh, and it has played the China card against us since the time of King Mahendra. Uh, and I've seen that uh, on the ground myself and dealt with the issues they were raising uh, for us in a very provocative <coughs> manner. Now with the Maoists in power, <coughs> whether India did the right thing or wrong thing in helping the Maoists uh, uh, to come to power under the, gar under the garb of democracy, I don't know, it's an open question. But the king was always problematic for us, so I suppose uh, policy makers at that time weighed the options and they felt that let Nepal be democratic. Anyway, um, China 
is, uh, has penetrated Sri Lanka in a very big way. And, and Sri Lanka, since the rice rubber deal with China in the 60s, has always played the China card against us. Uh, it's always been a problematic country. Uh, Maldives, we have been succeeded in recovering our ground, but the same mischief making of local elements there uh, with China's encouragement and involvement have been trying to undermine our strategic interests in the Indian Ocean as part of their larger maritime uh, strategy. In Bangladesh, they are the biggest supplier of arms uh, to Bangladesh. So, uh, and then they have a lot of money. See, the thing is this, these countries need development. And uh, so where do they get funds from? For building infrastructure and other developmental projects. They go to the IMF or the World Bank, their conditions. And they, they exact a lot of policy concessions from the governments if you want loans and projects from them. And then there's no corruption because they watch over this. <laughs> but China comes with this bag full of money. They buy up the local elites. Uh, it's a very different way of functioning. Uh, and also the, a debt trap. Yes, but, yeah, but, they don't, but if you talk to the Sri Lankans, they still don't admit it's a debt trap. They'll give you all kinds of statistics, you know, we only owe 10% of our debt to, uh, to China, we owe more debt to the World Bank and stuff like that. It's a narrative that they will they continue to build. So we can't compete with China in terms of uh, their money power and their absolutely fantastic ability to develop infrastructure, which they have done inside the country and as part of the BRI, they're extending it uh, all over the world. They are now, there's now a backlash against it. That's a different matter. But uh, if we get into this game of uh, competing with China, rupee for, for rupee, we'll never win. So what we, the best we can do, and here we are trapped, that we have to make concessions. Uh, let, tolerate the fact that they will play the China card, but keep that aside and see where we can build up closer ties. And whether we have done the, enough of that, whether we should integrate Nepal into our economy uh, before it is too late, because once they build all those connections, railways and roads and everything else, then you have a huge issue of Chinese goods coming into our country. Uh, these are very significant uh, challenges, but to answer your question very specifically, we should work to our strength. And, uh, and I think what the Modi government is also doing rightly, it has some long-term positive consequences, <clears throat> is to build on the cultural and religious uh, foundations of our ties with this country, which China cannot. And that appeals to the people. Um, I can ask you many more questions, but as we are coming to the end of uh, our time, um, I would like to ask you the last two questions. One is on Bangladesh. Um, like you said, we, you know, there's a Chinese footprint in Bangladesh in terms of mega projects that they're investing in. Uh, recently in a speech, um, Sheikh Hasina said that uh, the U.S. is aiming for a regime change. Um, if a regime change happens, considering that we enjoy stronger relationships than ever with Bangladesh right now, but if a regime change happens, how does that impact India in terms of, you know, one of our greatest threats seems to be the Rohingyas or the illegal uh, migration and B, um, with China's uh, mega projects, do you think we need to speed up our investments there? For instance, the water sharing agreements. Look, we, <coughs> I think <coughs> we've been over generous with regard to <coughs> water sharing. 80% uh, of the waters of the Indus Basin went to Pakistan. We signed the Ganga <coughs> Accord with Bangladesh. Uh, as if uh, we are a country overflowing with uh, water. We have already water stressed ourselves. Uh, but we made these, made these concessions. We were willing to deal uh, positively on the Tista Barrage issue, but uh, Mamta Banerjee, uh, because of local politics, has been a big hurdle. <clears throat> so I don't think uh, <clears throat> water sharing is an issue which we can uh, resolve to Bangladesh's satisfaction because the West Bengal government uh, is involved. 
<clears throat> there are other issues down the line, uh, down the road. Uh, China is building huge projects on the Brahmaputra. How this may affect the water flow uh, south of the Himalayas, and how it may affect India and, and Bangladesh, and whether we should join hands together and deal with this issue. So far, I don't think we have succeeded in that. Uh, the the Chinese, you see, the funny part is that uh, China didn't recognize Bangladesh for many years. They were against the creation of Bangladesh. When it comes to India doing something here and there in the past, Nepal or Sri Lanka will always remind you, oh, you did this to us in the past, oh, you did this in the past. But in the case of Bangladesh, they seem to have forgotten that they were against the creation of this country. Uh, but uh, there are forces in Bangladesh which have been historically anti-Indian. And uh, they will play those games in any case. And if Sheikh Hasina is ousted from power, uh, because uh, it's not as if she doesn't have challenges on the ground herself, political challenges. Uh, I must say she's an extremely brave woman. She's taken head on, head on, head on these Islamists, hanged many of them. Um, but what she has done is that she has created uh, uh, connectivity with us in so many areas that it can't be reversed. Uh, and therefore, even if there's a change in government, things may slow down, but what has happened cannot be reversed. Uh, so uh, we will have a challenge because the BNP government, the Tariq Rahman or whatever his name is sitting in London, there will be an issue. It will be in our interest to see Hasina uh, succeed once again uh, electorally, but this is not in our hands. This is not in our hands. Correct. Finally, sir, I want to ask you, we have a neighborhood first policy. How important do you really think it is to foreign policy, considering a lot of other countries around the world don't practice the same? You know, each government when it comes to power talks about neighborhood first. On paper, it makes sense uh, that if you have less problems in your neighborhood, then you have more time to concentrate beyond the region. Uh, but our problems in our neighborhood will not go away. Uh, Pakistan is not going to go away. Uh, Nepal is going to be a problem. Bangladesh, for the time being, our most successful policy, neighborhood policies vis-a-vis -vis Bangladesh. But it all depends on internal evolution in Bangladesh. Uh, Sri Lanka, uh, despite all that we had done, four or five billion dollars of everything, they allowed this Chinese spy ship to come. Uh, and one doesn't know uh, what the future uh, may be because they're, they're not easy to deal with. Uh, in in uh, Maldives, uh, there are still forces which want to disrupt the India-Maldives ties, uh, but at the moment uh, uh, we are, they are under control, but the, but the leaders are so volatile uh, there, uh, especially in Nasheed, that <laughs> it also depends on personalities there and how they manage their internal politics and the impact of that on our bilateral relations with Maldives. So these are not things under our control. But I say very often that all big countries have problems with neighbors. Huh? Uh, United States has problems with neighbors. Uh, Russia has huge problems with neighbors. China has huge problems with neighbors. So in a sense, you have to accept the fact that a big country will have problems with neighbors. Number two, problems in our neighborhood hasn't uh, stalled India's economic rise. We we'll continue to rise. It will continue to rise. Uh, so uh, why should we uh, think that uh, un un unless we manage our neighborhood, we won't be able to become a big power? We are becoming a big power despite our neighborhood. Uh, so uh, yes, as a, as a broad policy, it's the right policy. And attention should be devoted. Finances should be devoted. Political capital should be invested in that. I fully agree. But to, for, to accept the logic that uh, unless you manage your neighborhood better, you won't be able to be a big power, I just don't buy it. 
Yeah. And they don't buy it. In fact, big powers have become by by dominating their neighbors as much as they can. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you so much, you know, Dr. Zibbal, for giving us that overview on our neighborhood. And uh, I think I will have to end this by agreeing with you that, you know, not necessarily what's right on paper is correct in reality. Thank you so much. Good, good.